The, uh, actually, I'm torn between two specific talks to give you. And uh, I don't know how it's going to really turn out. Whether I blend them or I just kind of skip one, one side of it or, uh, or not. But uh, the two talks are to give you an outline of what it is basically we're trying to progress into when we think about the Eucharist and specifically how the a whole idea of the covenant meal is supposed to immediately to our consciousness bring us into an awareness that we're the body of Christ, that there's a way that we're supposed to live like Christ, and that we are called to fill out the covenant intentions of God as a people. And what all that means as far as this way of life and what's necessary. And the other is the absolute necessity for zeal of the Lord. Now, I've talked about desire a great deal, but I can never talk about it enough until you start, until you start talking to me about it. Well, now you start talking to me about it, and when you start talking to other people about the zeal of the Lord, then I think that, all right, we, we, we've got a piece of that that we need to have. Because if it doesn't begin with this love for God, that it gets expressed through zeal, through this, this fire, you know, the word for zeal is boiling, is heat. If we do not have this zeal, we can have all the right form, and it can be of God, and it can be beautiful as, for, as far as his intentions are concerned. But if each one of those things is not filled with a deep, deep love for God, and if our desire to see the church be covenant community is not primarily fueled out of deep love for God. And if our whole attitude toward life is not, does not have that as a basis, then we've, we're the clanging gong, or we've wasted our time. We've more than wasted our time. Perhaps we could fall into an illusion that we're doing the right thing when we've missed it all. And so what we have to, and it's very difficult sometimes to to articulate what I'm trying to get at here when I talk about zeal for the Lord. But let me, uh, let me explain it by way of a story about, and, and perhaps you know it, it's in Numbers 25, and it talks about Phineas, who is the grandson of Aaron in the priestly line. And there at Chittim, the people, were, as they were waiting there, as they were, as they were lodging there, dwelling there, that throughout that time, uh, some say it's Balaam's inspiration. He, he, he gave a blessing, but he gave a strategy to, uh, to the Moabites about the way that to defeat them is basically to have them co-inhabit the, the daughters of Moab. And so that's what happened. So after a while, more and more of the people of God they started to have relations with these women and they started to, they were first invited. They were invited to worship with them and they took the invitation. So already you see that there's a very low level of zeal and a low level of consciousness that there's supposed to be a people unto God. And what happens is, is that God's intention, regardless of what their intentions are, God's intentions is they be a people set apart for him to reflect what it means to love in purity, to love in faithfulness, and to love God as the one God. As I've said before, when uh, the Hillel, that, you know, the Lord our God is one, that is not a reference to his, uh, to his ontological being with singularity. That's how it gets, you know, redacted later on um, after the fall of the temple. But primarily it was saying, God is one for you. He is totally one for you, um, and he is loyal to you. And they say the Lord our God is one. is supposed to be a reference to who they are to be to him, because then it goes on to say, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. So it's talking about this fidelity and this, this love relationship toward, and which, is, which is what holiness is. Holiness, always remember, is love, set apart to love more. Love, totally set apart to love with great purity. Holiness gets expressed through, of course, there's practical dimensions to it, but that's the intention. So anyway, here in Chittim, the people 
have now uh, interspersed with uh, Moabites and the plague has fallen upon them. And as a result, the, this plague is killing the people. And Moses, Moses calls to the leaders and says, begin to kill those who have, who have had sex with the Moabites. But they're just weeping over what has happened. They're weeping over the plague. They're weeping over their unfaithfulness. And there's Phineas there in the tent of meeting, joining the congregation in prayer and repentance. And while this is going on, Phineas notices that one of the people from Moab came, come, comes and brings one of the daughters of the Moabites right to a tent of one of, one of the Israelites to co-inhabit again, to, to have sex with. And Phineas notices that. And uh, Phineas, what he does is, he, in the midst of, you can see this number is 25, in the midst of it, he gets up from his weeping, he gets up from his worship, he, he excuses himself, very inappropriate, this is not the protocol appropriate for worship, but he gets up and he moves and he sees the tent that, they, that these two are now co-inhabiting, he grabs a spear and he pierces them both through. Probably they're in an embrace because it says he pierced them both all the way through. So the implication is that, you know, uh, you know, he just can't take it anymore. Did you notice that he did not consult anybody if you look in this passage? He didn't ask, is this the right thing to do now? I want to be under submission. I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. His heart is so full of the love of God and understanding what God's intention is, he knows the right thing to do. His zeal for God told him the right thing to do. That's how God's people are supposed to be. When we move into the zeal of God, the zeal of the Lord, you know the right thing to do. You don't have to consult anybody, and you don't care if it looks inappropriate or not, because you're so aware of the transcendent God. He is so real, personal to you, and intimate, and you, you can like touch him. You're that aware of it, you don't care what other people think. And so, right when he did that, the Lord speaks. And uh, I'm not sure, it could have spoke, I think he spoke through Moses. Let's see if I have the whole text or not. Um, so in Numbers 25, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy. This is very important. Jealous with my je uh, jealousy. Or as some translations will say, say, zealous with my zeal. Same thing. So he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. What's really important is that our relationship with God is so intimate and so deep that when we're talking about what it means to be the people of God and to restore God's intentions for the church, we will not do it appropriately. And it will not be worship unless it comes from the zeal of the Lord. And I'm telling you, this is huge. This is everything. If it's not from the fire of God within us, and it's the fire of God, it's not just being zealous. You know, a people, a real estate agents are zealous. Uh, Al-Qaeda is zealous. This is not the zeal of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord is his own fire, his own love that burns within him that we, are, we open ourselves so that he kindles that in us. And now the fire of God does consume. The fire of God isn't simply a torch, but it consumes everything that cannot be ignited. It becomes ash. And I'm going to tell you right now that our desire for being a people of God, we may, we may not get a lot of these concepts. Maybe we hardly get any of the concepts, but we get a few, a few very fundamental ones. If you and I have the fire of the Lord, it will be done. The fire of God has to live in us. This love of God. And now, he, what's the fire of God? The fire of God is 
when you see the love of God or you hear the word of God and, you, and in your soul it says, yes, that is good. That is good. That is pure. That is right. That makes, that makes sense to how I see everything in Christ. When that resonates with you and you realize that that's a precious seed from the Lord, then you take that seed and you care, you care for it. Or that fire, that when you hear that fire, you've got to take care of the fire. You've got to take care of it. It will not constantly be thrown out to you. The fire is thrown out as a gift, but we must prepare a place for the fire. When we prepare a place for the fire, then it grows in us. And then, that fi- then when we are gathered together, brothers and sisters, the fire is greater together than it is when we're apart. So each of you has to bring a fire, and I have to bring a fire. But we all have to bring the fire of the Lord, so that when I talk with you and you talk with me, I just want to give my life to God. When you talk with me and I talk with you, I get an eternal perspective, and I say, you know, I've been contemplating things that are just plain stupid. They're not important. I see some things now. See, that's the zeal and the fire of God that must be alive in us, because That's a part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is meant for for all to come into. But we there's another kingdom here. It's a competing kingdom. And if we dryly or in a plodden way, you know, articulate or speak about the kingdom to someone else, that's not going to cut through. That's not going to cut through the darkness. You need a beacon of love and zeal to cut through that. And so one of the words to us, brothers and sisters, is that any time you get inspired, you pray that to get deeper in you. You don't even just re-listen to the tape or watch the DVD or reread the book. You pray that it gets branded in you and it becomes your own. It's, it's so important. I'd say this, three people, three people filled with the fire of God, community could happen much quicker than a hundred people who are just dedicated. But I'm telling you, the fire of God must be cared for. It's a holy fire. So what I'm saying is this. I guess I'm kind of giving the other talk a little, but I won't give too much. Be careful what you watch. Is it going to ennoble you? Is it going to call you on to live more fully for God, or is it just pure entertainment? I like entertainment. I find, I love stories. That's why I like entertainment. But I am really careful about the kind of entertainment I'm exposed to. And the goal isn't for me just to be entertained. The goal is, am I going to want to give myself at a higher level for who the Lord is afterwards? I mean, some can be just innocuous, but I'm careful even with the innocuous. Because after a while, I just lose a sensitivity. See, each of us is called to be priests, kings and priests in the temple of God. The people of God have to regain the sense of of what God has called them to, to be holy people. So we are kings and priests in the holy of holies. And that that should preoccupy us. Not other things, that should preoccupy us. So if you have three people who who have that sense and they pray, they say, God, we must have men who will be men, men who love the word of God. You send them and help me to be such a man that I can embrace them and call them on. When you have the fire of God, you pray prayers. It's almost like you're demanding God. In fact, one of the Greek words is in the imperative for ask, which is like demanding Lord, you must do this. You must do this. I can't bear it if you do not do this. These are the kinds of prayers that should come out from the prayer house. Now, like, what is on the sheet there? What is in your heart? What has God put in your heart? And if there's nothing, if it's not strong enough, if you have to search too much, God can help you. Kindle the fire there. But the fire is not just emotion. You see, Phineas was a devoted man before and after the spearing. He was just, he was just predisposed that way. And when, you, when you're full of zeal and you have this sense of the transcendent, 
You don't really think, you don't really care where it all, where it all falls. Except you are faithful to what was imparted to you. So, this is where we have to go. We have to be like this. We have to be a very zealous people. And God gives us enough. I know he does. He gives us enough to be zealous. And brothers and sisters, I know that we have a level of zeal. I understand that. I'm grateful for that. But it's just not enough. And you say, well, what's enough? It's enough when we clearly invade darkness by just living our lives. When it's really clear that we're living for the Lord and we're in love with Him and we wish others to love Him and that's all we're living for. That's all we're living for. That's all we're living for, to love Him and to ignite a love in others. And I don't mean to be momentarily inspirational. I hope I'm inspirational a bit. It should be inspirational. God gives Himself. We receive Him and there's a fire in there. See, I, you know, I've been in situations I'm sure you have. I've been in all kinds of situations, church situations. And uh, I see a lot of people who are just church goers, church doers, even dedicated church people. But I don't see a lot of people who, are this, who have this zeal of the Lord. And you know, the re one of the reasons is, is that they're not an environment to kindle the zeal. I think a lot of people would like to be zealous, but you need to be in an environment of zealous people to become zealous many times. And see, this is our hardest task, isn't it? Because we're trying to begin something. We should have grown up in a zealous environment. We shouldn't have to be told this. This stuff is like, not, this, is like this is like preschool stuff. You know, you love God with all your heart, soul, body, and strength. Of course, that's what it's all about. And it's so alive to us. But what what uh, makes the message so, so weak is that there's not a culture that, that radiates that out. Now, the way that it's going to happen, there's only one way it's going to happen, and that we hunger for it, and that we're willing to pay any price. And paying any price, I wish, I wish it was just once. I wish it was like jump, jumping off a cliff, you know, and I've dedicated my whole life, and here I go, oh, I'm falling down there. What else can I do again in my life? I wish it was like that, but it's not like that, because... I think that maybe all of us would jump off that cliff. But it's, Paul says, I die daily. It's understanding this, this consecration that calls us to live this out every day. In some ways, in some ways it's easy to be a martyr because that's just a one-time deal. But to live martyrdom, that's harder. And that's what we're called to. And you know what? I hope you understand. I'm not talking about dedication again. I'm talking about love. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times people misunderstand this and they fall right into legalism. And that's just terrible. It just mocks the whole thing. It's like God can't ignite such a love in us that we just have to follow rules really faithfully and think that's it. That's not it. That's not it. That, uh, that I should be able to see a fire in someone's eyes, just see excitement for the Lord. I should be able to learn about God from this person. Not because they've studied all the Greek, but just because of their own union with God. And they should call me on and help me love the Lord and help me love my brothers and sisters. And zeal, this, this zeal performs the works of God. So that's why it's so important, this fire being first. So when you hear this word, brothers and sisters, uh, nurture every moment of inspiration you get. No matter where it comes from me or somewhere else, it doesn't matter. Whatever moment of inspiration it calls you to greater consecration, because we must see God very clearly to be about the work we're called to. It must come from, from knowing his face. So what we need to do is we need to be, as, have a, be a people who have zeal of the Lord. Now, I think of this passage in Isaiah 37, 32. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survival, survivors. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. And that passage is both in 2 Corinthians 19.31 and in parallel in Isaiah 37.32. The same, the same passage. And, and this is a prophetic word that after the exile that you know, God is going to raise up a remnant. But the zeal of the Lord will perform this. 
And uh, what we think right away is, we think, well, good, God's going to get to this. But what we don't understand is the zeal of the Lord performs it through prophets and through leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah. It's through people who have the zeal of God in them, who say, I will not tolerate anything but the will of God being done upon the earth. And, you know, you can't do that and sustain that kind of zeal unless it's from the Holy Spirit. You can be inspired for a moment because of your personality type or, you know, you just saw something amazing and your emotions naturally respond. But the zeal of the Lord, the zeal of the Lord is able to do mighty works with people who are willing to give themselves fully to him. And the zeal of the Lord can do powerful things for people who have the zeal of the Lord. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Isaiah 9, 7. Again, the Lord, in both these contexts, we're talking about gathering of people and now manifesting a reign. And it comes about from the zeal of the Lord. Clearly, that is the person of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, zealously, lovingly giving what his people need to bring this about. It's both his, it's his initiative and our engaging in that outpouring that allow us to manifest the reign of God. And so, faithful men and women, before Jesus is appearing, the zeal of the Lord has performed this to bring it about. And Jesus himself being that zealous man. So we have to note this context. And what we're called to be is people who love God to the point of zeal. Dedication, it just doesn't, doesn't work. It. And it is, you know, what people might sometimes understand as uh, faithfulness. If faithfulness doesn't have a fire of God in it, it's not faithfulness. It's dutifulness. And that's, not, that's a bad witness to God. I believe he's so loving that a natural response would be a zealous love in return. So the psalmist says, for the zeal, now here's what I want to say. I'm going to talk about the zeal of the Lord and the zeal for his church. And I'm going to make it clear, hopefully you'll see this, that, that one of the things that we sometimes we're tentative about, we say, okay, I'll be zealous for God, but I don't really understand how I can be zealous for the church at the same time. I mean, uh, I talked to one person once, and I talked to them about dedication, and, and I talked to them also about understanding their call to build church, and the response is, well, you know, I'm, I'm first called to, to love Jesus, you know, and then the church. And, uh, and that's good. I'm glad I heard that comment. I think it's a real typical response. But that's because people don't understand the innate connection between the Lord and his body. They think it's really separate. And so for me, and for you, I hope, I, I assume, my, my love for the church directly, absolutely, no question in my mind comes from my love for the Lord. I could not love the, the body of Christ if I did not love the body of Christ. And uh, so the psalmist says, For the zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So what that is saying right there is, he's saying, I so identify with you, Lord, that when they shame you and they mock you, I feel that. I feel that deeply. And that's come upon me. There's this identity, see, with the Lord and his house. They mock your house. They mock your people. That, I mean, they mock what you are about, and I take that personally. And that's part of zeal, brothers and sisters. Many times, we Americans are too detached. We have our theology. We have our understanding of how life works. And a lot of it doesn't have a lot of passion in it. A lot of it doesn't have a lot of depth to it. And, and with this writer, he understood that whatever people said against the house of God, and what all that that stood for, he took personally. You know, Lord, they're saying that about me. Now, I hear something. Are you here? Listen, I, that... What they're saying about the church, that deeply grieves me because that gives a mockery to who Jesus is. 
Now, I understand some people say, well, we're done with the church. That's a wasteland. We just give up on the church. And I understand what they mean behind that. That indeed, it's that unfaithfulness that, um, that merits what is called the church not to be church. I understand that. I, I, I resonate with that. But the reality is, brothers and sisters, that's not how God would wish it to be. He wishes the church would be a reflection of who he is. And so, so since we see the church mocked and maligned, and we understand why, that that should hurt us because we understand with it, the Lord is mocked and maligned. Like, you know, he can do miracles, but he can't change the lives of people who are his followers. It's like they're saying to us, come on, you know, get with reality here. Look at this. And so these, all these books, you know, we, uh, we love you, Jesus, but it's your follower, followers we can't take. And that's becoming more and more popular. And, and numbers of Christians saying the same thing. Yeah, the church is a ruin. I say, I know you're a ruin. You, you're a ruin. See, it's not the church over there. It's you. You are a part of the church. You are a ruin. And you, you're such in a ruin, you don't even know you're talking about yourself. Yeah. Mm. We think it's this man-made institution. And they don't think of the Holy Spirit had anything directly to do with it, almost. And that's just not a biblical way to understand the church. And certainly the Lord doesn't relate to it that way. Eh, it, doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me. It's meaningless. No, it isn't that way at all. In fact, uh, look at this. Uh, this passage in John, and you're familiar with it. it co it's quoting this psalm, John 2, 15 through 21. And Jesus made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house, my father's house, a place of business for consumers. Get it? And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me, according to the psalm. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us? Is your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. He was making the connection between that temple and his body. So Jesus didn't say, you know, I know the temple's a ruin. It's been a mess for so long. Let's just skip that. Let's build another temple. This zeal of the Lord was in Jesus. The zeal of the Lord needs to be in us. And you know, if it is in us, it will consume us. We will do things that seem inappropriate. When's the last time you or I did something that seemed really over the top because of our zeal for the Lord? Like, you should have been embarrassed, but you weren't. That's what zeal does. It consumes you. See, I want to be with people who will call me to be a fool for Christ. Can you be that for me? I'll, I'll help you be that. Can you help me be for that? Let's stir up the fire together. The spirit who lives within us. Let's get a transcendent view of life together. Let's stir it up. Let's stop being so domesticated. Let's stop being so predictable. Let's, let's stop being so religious in many ways where we're doing the right thing but without the fire. All torches should be ignited, not just held, without fire. See, that's our call. God will give us that if we want that. Let's pray that in this prayer house. Fire that will consume us, that will make you and I a spectacle for the glory of God. So the zeal of the Lord was in Paul. I mean, he would say something at the end of his letter, remember near the end of his letter? If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. Well, that doesn't sound very seeker sensitive. <coughs> That's not very friendly. You know, people don't, you know, they have to understand about, they don't know him. And he's talking to his church, though. He says, if you don't love the Lord, you should be accursed. And that makes sense to him. How can that make sense to you? God created these people. He put breath in their lungs. They're made to be immortal. 
There's a divine design, an imprint on their soul. He sees it. He understands it. And if you don't love him, that's insane. And so if you talk, if you know in your heart of hearts that if you don't love him, being accursed makes sense because that is the, that's the opposite of the intention of God. It is to answer his love with our love. But if we don't know that, but we feel like we're stumbling on that point, we have to consider that a little more fully. Then that's the point we need to invite the fire. Because when he says Maranatha, which means Lord come, you know why he's saying that? Let the judgment begin. That's, that's, the, that's the intention. When the Lord comes, he's going to judge this. So he's calling the church to a fear of God, which is virtually absent in our communities, in our congregations today. So this is Paul. And so Paul makes the connection between love of God and love of his people. So there's God's identity with his, te with his temple and God's people. And then there's our identity with God in his temple. For, and um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 9 it says, to the church of God, which is in Corinth. This is important because he's saying, you're the temple. You're the temple at Corinth. They have temples. You're the temple of God, the true God there. And so he says, he's addressing them as the tabernacle of God. And in verse 9, God is faithful through whom you are called into fellowship with his son. Hopefully that's more meaningful to us. It's a whole way of life that looks like fellowship with Jesus Christ into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 and verses 2 and 9. So now, the Christian's identity in Christ as members of his body. So there's back and forth. I'm trying to make this connection, see. I want you to not feel embarrassed about being zealous for the restoration of the church with a zeal that is singular, singular for God. Our culture will divide the church from union with God, but the Holy Spirit united the church with his people by the Holy Spirit so that we could have a union with God and one another. And if you don't, if you don't make that connection, you're going to always think I'm going overboard. You're going to always think I'm saying, I'm saying it too far or too much. Or Jordan... Why can't you teach about anything else? Because the church is being decimated from the, by an individualism that does not understand the connect between love of God and love for people of God. Does not understand that the Spirit of God has been given liberally to the people of God to manifest the body of Christ. It has forgotten that. Or it's, so, it's made it so ethereal and abstract that there's no way to really relate to it with real life. You have to carry that message and with fire. With fire that comes from your love for God. And if you're embarrassed, I will help you to make all the biblical connections because it's obvious. In fact, I will say it's been obvious and has been obvious for a millennia at least, for a thousand years. Even in the Reformation, there was a connect with it. Only recently have we not even seen that there's much of a connection, and that's just delusion. It's a part of the enemy's tactic to divide and conquer. When there's splintering and fragmentation, the message becomes diluted. So, do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6.15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? I believe he meant that literally. What do you mean literally? Didn't you say like Jesus has, like, you know, a couple hands that that look like a, you know, an assortment of five, five of us, or ten of us, one for each finger. There's a mystical union that's more deep than the union of our parts to our bodies and ourselves. That's Ephesians 5. There's a more of an intimate connection. And really, if we restore that intimate connection, there will also be a great difference in how we pray and what we expect to happen when we pray. See, absence of understanding the unity or their union between God and his body has a great deal of different, uh, effect on how you pray and believing you're going to get answers. If you think God's still somehow out there and not really member to you by the Holy Spirit, 
there's a huge difference in what you're expecting. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, do you not know that you, and this is in the plural, that you all are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, just like the Spirit of God dwelt in the tabernacle. See, now Paul's saying, don't you see that you're it now? You're it there in Corinth. Wow! Spirit of God in you, just like in the Holy of Holies. You Shekinah glories on you as the temple of God. And no one is a temple. <sighs> Not in this sense. If any man destroys the temple of God, listen to this word. If, anyone, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you all are. Now stop about that. Think about that. I haven't heard that really preached on correctly. How does that usually get preached on? Do you know? Self-destructive behavior. Right. Suicide or self-destructive behavior. It has nothing to do with the context. Nothing to do with the context. Read the context. It's divisions in Corinth. And you who are citing out particular parties, you keep fighting that way. And if you work to destroy the church, you will have judgment for that. Because, as it says here, for the temple of God is holy, and that's what you, plural again, you all are. It's time to call holy what God calls holy and to treat it as holy, even if your neighbor does not understand that, or even if the television preacher has no idea about that, what do you think the Word of God teaches? And if you say, I don't really know what the Word of God teaches, why not? You got a Bible? I got a Bible. Read the Bible. Own it. Let that Word burn in you. Let it matter. Because you might think, well, it doesn't really matter because we're not that big. And what does it matter anyway? And people love God and they love God in their own ways. We become relativistic. What does, do you think that will matter in the last day? <laughs> So love for God and love for those in him is what we're trying to say here. That, um, it, of course, it's got to be that way. I can't, say, uh, I can't say to someone, Edgar, uh, I can't say to Edgar, Edgar, you know, I really love you, but I really hate your body. So I'm just going to slap it around a little. He says, well, Edgar says, Ed, that hurts, but it's just your body. And then push you down, okay? Well, you know, I'm getting kind of hungry. I don't really care about your body, Edgar, but I love you. And that's kind of some, some kind of, um, that's how we relate to the church and to God's people. So mystically, we love them. Spiritually, we care about them. But when it comes to fleshing that out, because we are in flesh, And that's, and Jesus was in flesh. When we start to communicate love, you know, you've got to go through the body. You're going to have to go through the mind to communicate love. Yeah, and if you're even praying for the person, there's some way that we have this, this spirit-body connection, because even the body will rise in the last day. It's not done. Okay. So I'm saying all this because I'm talking really about a way of life that God's calling us to and, uh, and that the Eucharist is to restore. And what I'm saying is a, a key problem for us and, and for the church at large is that um, our zeal isn't strong enough. You know, I'm going to tell you this too. I'm going to be honest with you. I hope you understand. My zeal will never be strong enough. But if you're zealous enough, you'll understand that and you'll, you'll find a peace in it. <laughs> you'll be glad that you're in such an environment that where your zeal can never be too much. It's like, can you love God too much? Can you love too much? Well, so the problem today is that in the church that the zeal has grown cold. And as Jesus said himself, 
In the last days, hearts would grow cold. And it said lawlessness would reign. And lawlessness is, an, is a word that they understood as of her wickedness. Some translations say wickedness, which is a translation of breaking covenant. That's why it's lawless. It's breaking the law. It's not, you know, it's not Roman law. It's breaking the Torah, the word of God. And that's where we're at. People evaluate how they're doing spiritually by, wait a second, how I feel right now. I feel at peace. I think we're doing okay. Things are kind of going well. But, but Jesus says, what you know is, what the, but about the state of your heart and your love for his word and the life that it engenders. And what kind of life are we living? Is it in concert with it? And today, we have little love for one another. We don't know one another, and we emphasize our individual being over and against our corporate identity. The individual being is of God and is beautiful, but it actually radiates life within the context of a whole, a whole bouquet, you know, with, with contrasting color or members to the body. It's, it's the analogy that Paul uses himself. You know, one member unto itself, a finger thrown on a carpet. It's kind of ugly and ghastly. And we, the only reason we even know it's a finger, isn't it? Because it's a relationship <coughs> to the whole. There are no finger beings. <laughs> right? We only know the finger because it's a relationship to the whole. And we as persons should understand that who we are gets accentuated, not blurred, in connection to the whole. Because love is that way. So, so what we have to do to, re to resolve this problem for lack of zeal and this passivity and this hyper-individualism is we need to reintroduce the Pentecostal paradigm. Something I've talked about a lot and will talk a lot about in the future. So right again, Acts 2, 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. So what you see here is, brothers and sisters, you see a whole way of life. There's a way of life here. It wasn't a church service that was being described. Maybe you get a little glimpse of that, but only within the context of their whole life. And so what you see right from the beginning is, what they had to do is they, had, they, they underwent baptism. And in baptism, they were making this understanding, that they were uniting themselves to Christ, and they would die the death that Christ died. That, that's right, Romans 6, 3-4. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Wouldn't we like to say baptized into his resurrection, baptized into his glory? But we're baptized into his death. That there's the death that it gets undergone when you enter a whole way of life. In a way that there's a death you do not undergo if you just take a seat and you sit for an hour and a half, uh, sing songs, pray, or whatever else. So do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might too walk in the newness of life. See, you die to share in the resurrection glory. Now this is the problem, brothers and sisters, I think, with the church today. We don't have this resurrection glory because we didn't really fully die. Or we constantly renegotiate. What, what we thought was supposed to happen in baptism. We don't really think it meant dead to one life to enter into another. 
So we look to the church as a way of kind of inspiring us and helping us out to live our life. We don't look at the church as the means for us to help us understand that we did, we're died in Christ and now we have a whole other kind of life. So now let's talk to you as a Christian disciple, as one who has decided to live a whole other kind of life. Most churches do not talk to us from there. I understand you got problems. I'm going to tell you how you deal with all your problems in a significant measure. Understand that you're not living for yourself at all. At all. Only what's necessary to love. To love yourself, to love others. So these people were added, and they were added to this way of life. Now here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to um, talk about how this is all about restoration to the zeal of the Lord. So the chief reason why God's people are not zealous is that it's not really expected of them. I go to so many churches where people have uh, provided excuses from the pastors to compromise. I know it's tough, or it's all a tough time, and we all have got difficult jobs, and et cetera, et cetera. And I understand that, but that's not the solution. The solution isn't just empathy. The solution is empathy and then another way of life. Provide them an alternative. Don't just be sympathetic about how bad it is. That is not real love. That does not go very deep. If you love them, provide a whole other way so they don't have to continue to inflict this or be inflicted upon by a society that isn't trying to really move in the kingdom of God. So it's not expected of them. So people are not supported in living a zealous life. In fact, if you go to another congregation, I mean, all you guys right now, I think to a person almost, if we just were to scatter, you guys are going to be in leadership. You'll all be in leadership of one sort or another, and people will just extol you and your consecration and your dedication. And that's pretty sad, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you know, some people, some people even look to me for some of my dedication and zeal. And they think it's like, wow. And I'm saying, you know, could you help me? Could you not just go, wow, could you help me get ready for the judgment seat? That isn't helping me. What is the point of the wow? How come it's not wow for you? What is wow? See, it's because we have a standard that's not based on the presence of God. Now, I understand that before the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to be judged by my works. I understand that. But, you know, love, brothers and sisters, love wants to give it all. I'm not talking about I'm worried about going to hell. I'm just concerned that what is entrusted to me from the loving God, I'm not giving a full return. And I want brothers and sisters to call me on to that. I don't want them to provide an excuse of why I can just be self-centered. I can provide plenty of those excuses for myself. And it really isn't helping me. Right? Is that where you're at? Yes. Good. Um, Zeal will be restored by people who embrace a way of life that expects, inspires, and teaches, and calls people on to love God with abandon. When you're right from the beginning, say, hey, you know what we're about? We're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. We understand that. Of course we will. It's almost silly to even make a mention of it because it should be so obvious. But we are committed to have a way of life that will inspire you to abandonment. To be like a Phineas, you know, that you're so aware of the transcendent presence of God, you don't really care what other people think. I like that. Yeah. Good. And a way of life that teaches us how to do that, how to live that out. So, I mean, you know, you can, you can call people to... Uh, uh, to a certain kind of a standard, you know, I'll be a SWAT team policeman or be a ranger or whatever else you want to say. And you can all hype it up, but when there is no real training to follow it up, then it's just you despair. You gave a big vision, but you didn't really help me move in that direction. And so that's why the way of life is so important. 
We need to call people to a big vision, and we need to have a way of life that helps us to be honest with this vision. We won't do it perfect. We'll do make lots of mistakes. Some of them probably we think it was really bad mistakes. But, you know, I'd rather make mistakes along that path than someone to say, I know it's a tough life. And they're not even really talking about the stuff that is tough, like carrying my cross for the sake of others. So like I said the other day, you know, when we were gathered as a, as a church, and I said that um, when you pre pre present the gospel to someone and they see that it's called into a way of life, and we explain what all that means, that one of the first responses is, whoa. And that whoa could mean, I guess you really mean it. <coughs> I guess you really mean a whole way of life. That's what we should be able to present to people. Okay, so what we see, what we see is that uh, this call is a life where we identify with the Lord. A people who are devoted to teaching and to fellowship. And however you want to view devoted, you know that it means more than just meeting a couple times. So they're devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. You know it means that, that I mean, that's a lot, whatever it is. It's more than, than we're experiencing. And uh, when people come to us and they understand that we're going to give instruction, and we're going to give instruction uh, to live this life. So wherever you go, in any kind of discipline, whether it's to be a doctor or whatever, they give you instruction not to consider and think about, but you need to use it when you're in surgery. It's not like, well, you know, I thought about that, but I haven't made up my mind yet. You know, you, better, you have better work that through when you're over the body and uh, you have to perform necessary surgery because it could mean life or death. And the people of God have to begin to understand that when the word of God is spoken to us, that this is our way of life. This isn't something like, well, I'll consider it. No, this is our way of life. The word, and there's, lot, there's some things that are ambiguous, but you know what? The bulk of it is not ambiguous. The bulk of it is just right out there clear. We just need support and we need people to call us on to be able to live this out. And so that's one of the things that needs to be restored. Zeal will again come back into the church when you call people to Christ and it will cost them their lives. Zeal will come back into the church when you give instruction and you're telling them, we do expect you to live this out. You won't live it out perfectly. You'll make mistakes. You need to be asking questions again. I forgot that. But overall, you're, you're, you're tracking to say, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm living. So I need to hear this. It's not just doctrine about different manners or times of the second coming of Christ. It's about what do you do in your house? What do you do with your spouse? What do you do with your money? What do you pray about? What's purity of heart? These kinds of things. And you take to heart these words. Also, as is, it could even be seen there in that little paradigm in Acts, the apostles are giving instruction. You know, and the instruction is authoritative. You know, the instruction is authoritative. So it's like, you speak a certain word, bless you. You speak a certain word, and now we're going to expect you to live that. And if you do not live that, we'll talk to you about that. Well, how come you're talking to me about it? Because you're a holy person. Because you're a priest and a king. You're part of the body of Christ. The Spirit, do you not know the Spirit of God dwells in you? That's why. This is not a club. It's not an organization to give spiritual support so we hope you get to heaven. You are the body of Christ. So we are addressing you as a holy people, as a holy nation. See what individualism does? It loses all the power from those statements. But they understood that. So the words were authoritative. They weren't just suggestions, and people were expected to follow the instruction. At each point, you see that there's a certain understanding. There, there will be a, a rekindling of zeal when there's restoration of church discipline. A little leaven leavens a whole lump, Paul says. And that's directly in effect of the power of sin. 
that there's so much bad leaven going on in the, in the, ch in the church that it's so distended and distorted and bloated that it really can't even hardly see the body of Christ in there anymore. And it's all because, many times, two, two reasons. Pastors are afraid to love to the degree that they might get personally rejected or the person might take their tithe and walk away. And the second part is because people view their lives as their own business. What I do with my life is my own business. They don't view it as a connection with the body of Christ. Hey, I'm here so you can support me living my life in Christ how I want to live it. As opposed to I'm here to understand that I'm a member of the body of Christ and I want to love people. I want to be a gatherer. I want people to be holy as he is holy. I'm here to love people. And if, that, if I, need, I need that word to love people, I want that word. As uh, even Josh McDowell said in his in his diagnosis of the, of the crisis of the church, he says the absence of church discipline is really telling because there's always going to be hip, hypocrites in the church. That's not, that's not really the issue. There's always going to be people who are going to sin in the church. That's not really the issue. The issue is what happens when you see hypocrisy and what happens when serious sin goes on and, you, and, and that's, what, that's what matters. And when it matters, and there's not, not any address, that's where there's a problem. Now see, my identity with who Jesus is in the body, that hurts me. Does that hurt you? We're not trying to point a finger. We're trying to give a holy offering of our hearts to God. Because he loves us and he loves others. And the more the temple is beautified, more people gather to him. Also that you see in that passage in Acts, you see that the church gathered, and it says the church gathered from house to house. It does not, that is not, in, in the study that I did in the Greek, that is not an argument for house churches. I don't really believe there was house churches the way we talk about them today. There was church in the house, and that's different than house churches. What do I mean by that? I mean that they had the Eucharist at one time at Fred's place, they had the Eucharist at one time at Bill's place, they had the Eucharist at one time in, in Ethel's place from house to house. But when you see that ever there's a mention of the church in the house, you'll see that that's like mentioned in one case, like in Romans, and there's just one, one household designated that way. The rest is and also greet the household of. Because they didn't have church buildings. What's my point? My point of that isn't to, isn't to be, offer a critique on the house church movement. That's not at all my point. My point is to simply say that what went on in the house, what went on in the church, was directly connected. You couldn't have one life in the assembly someplace else and then another different life where you really lived life. I mean, you're getting personal visitation from the brethren regularly about how you're living your life when they celebrate worship at your house. And it's that connect that's missing. Because we can all act zealous, can't we, someplace else. But when we're, where we live and how we speak, that's the most telling thing. And that's how you're handling the holy fire. It's the fi if the fire's there in your house, the fire's there in the house of God gathered in your house. <coughs> and these are a people who are constantly concerned about seeking the Lord, presenting, presenting themselves before the Lord. They would come before the Lord and they would ask of Him what He would wish. So when they're confronted, when they're confronted and told no longer to preach in the name, they would gather together and they would address the Lord and they'd say, Lord, extend your hand with signs and wonders to confirm our message about your holy servant Jesus. They, just, they weren't just doing church, they were being church. And they knew what to do in those situations. They gathered together to call down the power as a people, not as a bunch of individuals, not as separate prayer warriors, but as prayer warriors as a people. And you know, that's where we're all called to be prayer warriors. 
And also, lastly, the door was always open. People would gather to them. Now, I believe that as our zeal grows in our love for God, and as we manifest more clearly a culture that, that inspires consecration and joy, because there's another Holy Spirit, you're always going to have the fruit of joy. That when you have that environment, then what will happen is people will be drawn to us. Mm -hmm. You know? So, you know, I prayed sometimes, and I, you know, I pray that God be drawn to us, but I don't pray that God be that, excuse me, that people be drawn to us um, as an end. I say, Lord, and also make us worthy that people would be drawn to us. I, my goal isn't that there's people here. The goal is that we're faithful to what God's calling us to, so he's honored if he draws people to us. And that's why we're giving this talk this way.